All right, good morning. Come on in. We're going to stand up and worship our Lord this morning. So get on in here. If you're comfortable, stand and please stand with us. If you're not, stay where you're at. Lord knows where you are. God, I'm running for your heart, I'm running for your heart, till I am a soul on fire. Lord, I'm longing for your ways, I'm waiting for the day when I am a soul on fire, till I am a soul on fire. God, I'm running for your heart, I'm running for your heart, till I am a soul on fire, and Lord, I'm longing for your ways, I'm waiting for the day, when I am a soul on fire, till I am a soul on fire, Lord, restore the joy I have, I have a one. set our hearts on fire this morning. You are worthy. You're so worthy. And God, the reverence that you are due, Lord, is beyond what we can deliver. So God, just teach us in our hearts just how very reverent you are, Lord, and just how awesome you are and how deeply worthy you are of the glory and the praise that you receive here this morning. Lord, make our praise worthy of you. In Jesus' name, amen. thousand times I fail, still your mercy remains. Should I stumble again, I'm caught in your grace. Everlasting, the light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, the glory goes beyond all things.
they rise against me, but I will hold my ground. I will not fear the war, I will not fear the storm, my help it's on the way, my help it's on the way, my God. Oh, my
so much what you have for us today. We're going to be cracking that word open today, Lord, and your anointed is going to pour forth your message. Make our hearts ready for it. Make us ready that if you were to walk in this room, in the middle of this study, we'd be so lost in your word, so lost in your praise, that we wouldn't just be lost. God, give us the ability to focus all our attention on you today show you how much we truly love you. Let it not be lip service. Let our actions speak louder as we praise you and hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Good to see you all here this morning. Hey, just a few announcements before we uh, get into the word. Um, serving one another. We've got sheets on the table of areas to serve. Uh, we're going to need folks in the new building. Uh, Trish has volunteered to work the 
video camera, uh, so she's getting trained on that this morning. And uh, so that makes two for that, but we can still certainly use more. And, um, but as you, if you look at that sheet, there's all kinds of areas to, uh, that we can use people to serve. Um, if you remember, I know that's spelled wrong. I'm a terrible speller. I didn't see the thing, the distribution. Um, this is from uh, Joe and Tanya. If you remember, we, we loaded up that truck. Several of us were out there. And this is where they were heading out on the road. So this was a week and a half ago. And uh, they, they, these are just pictures that she sent. They were, they were almost there to the reservation. And uh, this is Ruby, the, the contact there for Navajo Nation. And go to the next one. And this is them starting to unload the food. And uh, families are, are helping them unload. It was kind of, sounded like it was a really neat thing. And, uh, and they said that they were very appreciative. There's the folks getting boxes of food. And go to that next one. Same thing, some more. And uh, Tanya sent that, that uh, <laughs> Joe did too much lifting. He was wore out. So that was the end of day one. And then, so day two, they're all, there's the folks waiting in line for food. And uh, so they said they served boxes to 200 Navajo families. And they dropped, then they, because remember we had enough food for 300. So they dropped off the, the, le the other 100 uh, boxes of food at, at a local food bank there in Flagstaff um, that uh, provides food for foster kids. And so they made some good contacts there too. And so this is a really cool thing. And Joe, uh, we've already been talking about this and they're gonna do something similar to at the neighborhood when we get moved in over there, like a monthly kind of thing. So I know several of you helped out with this. That is great, another great uh, service opportunity because they'll be need help with that, with setting up boxes and distribution and everything uh, when we get s settled in over there. And speaking of which, we got a lot done this week. We're moving forward. Uh, go to our first picture there. So we put the skirting on the, uh, this is the north end of it, uh, and that white, uh, Jill says it looks like a big larvae thing, but uh, <laughs> Uh, that's a French drain, so any water, because the, the water was kind of running under the building, and so we've got that side, and we closed off the other side last week, and we're leaving the other two open to let it just air out under there. And go to the next pick. And this one, uh, we put that French drain in last week, but uh, Amy and her crew uh, have moved dirt, a ton of dirt, if you can tell. So now the dirt's sloping away from that building. It's kind of sloping down to the center so the water comes out, not towards the building anymore. But we do have that drain in case it does go in there. And then this is the flooring. We're still working on that. Uh, it's a slow, kind of a long process. It, it goes really great until you start getting into the doorways and all of that just like slows everything down. So we had a lot of help yesterday. That was the main room. This is like the men's restroom is just a couple of planks short, a couple of rows short. The nursery is almost done, a couple of rows short, and uh, this is the kids, I guess it will be the K through second, and it's, uh, it looks like it's done, we just have to finish that last row and then they go to the next one, and that one's just a couple of planks short. We found, uh, my brother and I, Greg, as we were, that last row is uh, tough to get in <laughs> against the wall, and so in the conference room, we ended up it takes two of you kind of to do it all together and, it, and you can get it in there. So that's kind of why everything's uh, back to the last two rows. And so we'll get, we'll just go through and do them all, I guess. And this is the little, uh, it'll be the kids' restroom. So it is done. It, you could do that last row easy because it's just one little piece. But. And then, uh, so that's it. So it's moving forward. We got the floor going down. Hopefully we'll finish that. Um, this week, I'm thinking we got two or three more days of, we're just gonna do it in through the corridor, and then we have all our interior doors that are in the building. We'll bring all them in, we'll install all the interior doors, and that, then we'll probably do the baseboards, or at least the base, we don't even have to do baseboards to get our CO, but we don't wanna do stuff and ha have to move furniture over again, but, um, and then we'll do toilets and sinks in the bathrooms and uh, 
and then that'll help that'll clear everything out of the front building and that'll free up so we can do the floor in the from building and so we're still on track we paid the rent here for just through November and we're hoping that's our last payment so we may we may have to you know it may get close there the first or second week of December but uh, so far we're on track for that uh, and then I got the guy lined up to um, level out our the back area we're gonna put a uh, for parking it's grass right now and I'll just tell you the price difference so we had so to, to level it out and put gravel down crush and run it's a little under three thousand to do asphalt it's a little under twenty three thousand so it's twenty thousand dollar difference so if, when you when you get over there and you're like oh this gravel is terrible that's why it's twenty thousand dollar difference so and yeah there you go it's actually better for the for the rain runoff and everything you know, asphalt's what it collects. All the water goes somewhere and causes all kinds of problems. The gravel lets it soak in just like it's grass. So it's actually more environmentally friendly. Go with that. Go with that. Yeah, that's why we're doing it. It's not cost. But um, all right. And so, yeah, we're moving moving along. Um, any praises? Anybody want to share anything? about? Oh, Amy's got her hand up. Hold on just a second. Well, I'm just praising the Lord. Uh, Rob finishes his, my Rob, not this Rob, has finishes his um, temporary duty at Fort Jackson this week, and he'll be home on Wednesday. And we have the same exact four kids as we have when he left, so that is good. Yeah. Um, I've done my job. I kept them alive. And, um, but I just really did want to say a thank you and, uh, and praise the Lord for the brothers and sisters that just ministered to us and were the hands and feet of Christ um, this past month while Rob was gone, you know, folks that invited um, us out for coffee or came by and, you know, brought pizza to the house or just prayed with us or just took the time to encourage us or to love on us. So thank you for the service that you've done to your king um, by ministering to our family. We really appreciate it. And, and those prayers really held us together this month. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Anything else? Anybody else? I had uh, submitted a prayer request for my friend Denny Tell, and he was in pretty bad shape. I mean, they didn't know if he was going to make it. And he spent several weeks in the hospital and a couple weeks in rehab, and Denny is home, and he's doing well, and his wife is giving all praise, of course, because God's good. Amen. And... Uh, it was it's pretty it's pretty awesome and then i do have one other <laughs> i have a sister um karen and she always says that god doesn't listen to her because she's a mormon and i told her i says oh, god listens to you whether you're <laughs> no matter what if you pray to him he's gonna listen to you and uh she said Patty, she says, I need to find another church. And I said, okay. And she says, she said, I, I've been going to this one with her son. She's been going to this one with her son, and it's a Scientology church. And um, I said, well, Karen, look for a Calvary Chapel. And she goes, oh, I don't think they'd have a Calvary Chapel out this way. And so I did my thing getting on the Internet and Praise God, there is a Calvary Chapel right around the corner from her house. <laughs> so she says, I'm going this weekend. That this weekend I'm going. <laughs> right. So I'm it's that's a blessing. It's something I prayed for because I want her to be happy too. Amen. So, Praise God. Amen. Yeah. Anybody else? It's warm in here. I, Tony, I, Tony just turned it down. So, anything else? Uh, just before we pray, uh, we had a couple of members lost uh, their parents. Uh, had a parent pass away. Um, Oneida, her father passed away earlier this week, and uh, oh, she's right here. And uh, we're so sorry about that. 
and uh, Dan Pastor Daniel uh, lost his mother uh, just yesterday or the day before yesterday. And so Pastor Daniel, their, the service for that is today in Thomaston at 2 o'clock, right after here. I'm going to, Jill and I are going to race out of here and get down there. If, uh, but if you, anybody else is interested in going, let me know. I'll get them. I'll give you the information. And then Oneida's father has a graveside service on Monday morning in Montezuma, Georgia, which is even south of Thomaston, a little way down there. But we definitely want to be prayer. If we can get a few to gather around Oneida and just lift her up in prayer uh, and, and the family. And anybody else have a prayer need this morning? Raise your hand. Clay's got his hand up there. And anybody else? And Mackenzie's got her hand up. So if so, a few would gather around Clay and Mackenzie and Oneida, and we'll, we'll lift them up in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for these praises and for uh, all that you're doing. And Lord, we just want to lift up uh, Pastor Daniel and Tracy and that family right now with their loss and the service this afternoon. We just ask that uh, everything go well with that. And, and also we <clears throat> lift up Oneida and her family, Lord, with their loss. Lord, hear us now as we lift one another up to you. Heavenly Father, as we close out this time of prayer, we, uh, we lift up those that uh, have lost loved ones this week, Father. Uh, we pray for your comfort uh, to surround them, Father. We pray that you would be with uh, Daniel. pray that you would be with Oneida and their families, Father, during this time. 
Father, I'm just so thankful for Oneida and Daniel and their, and their testimony, Father. Uh, the love they have for you, um, Lord, it's, it's uh, contagious. Uh, the way they represent your kingdom here on this earth, Father. I'm just so thankful for their example in, in my life. Lord, just, just give them the power, your holy power, to overcome this time of, of sorrow, Lord. And Lord, we also lift up uh, the family members represented here among this body of believers that, that don't know who you are. We think of Tricia's sister who's, who's uh, on her way to a new church this morning, Father, to hear your word preached. And praise God. But Lord, I think of all the other uh, family members represented here that uh, don't know who you are. And Lord, I pray that you would give us the strength uh, to be that example and to be that mouthpiece for your Holy Spirit in their lives. And Lord, we lift up all of the unspoken requests this morning that, that we don't want to talk about. We lift those up to you right now, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, or I'm sorry, chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll be starting with verse 11. You know, when I was growing up, uh, every now and then we would have, especially after dinner, we would have, from time to time, we would have dessert. I love dessert. But the rule in our house was, unless you ate all of the food that was put on your plate, you didn't get any dessert. But we had the good fortune of having our granddaughter uh, over at our house this weekend. And uh, she's pretty picky. She likes junk food. And so she helped Dana fix a meal for us. But of course, she turned her nose up at it. So I had to make a run down to McDonald's. To get a happy meal, and I found out that those little gogurts that I thought were dessert weren't really a dessert, according to my granddaughter, because she ate it in the middle of her meal. I think, Bob, why are you telling us this story? The reason I'm telling you this story is this passage that we're going to go through, we're going to go from 11 through the end of the chapter. I can't wait for the dessert <laughs> at the end of this chapter. It is so good. I, I, I almost don't even want to wait. I just want to jump right into those last few verses, but... We're not. We're going to go through the scriptures verse by verse, like we always do. So, verse 11, it says, Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade men. Now, since then is a fancy way of saying, therefore. Well, what's it there for? Well, let's go back and read verse 10. And it says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade men. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. Do we have the fear of the Lord? Some translations actually say terror of the Lord. And if you are on the wrong side, when we are before God and that judgment that takes place, we will definitely see the terror of the Lord. And knowing that, we should be trying to persuade men. Persuade men what? We'll get into that in just a minute, if you don't already know what that is. But it says we are what we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. What does that mean, plain? Plain to God, plain to your conscience. In some, it, it says manifest to God, some translations. God searches the heart of the individual. Our heart. All men's heart. All women's heart. He searches the heart. And in this instance, Paul is saying that we are plain to God. And basically he's saying God has searched our hearts and he knows we are upright in our willingness to please him. Are we plain to God? Are we 
upright in our willingness to please him? And then it says, speaking to the church in Corinth, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. Paul has been there at Corinth before. He's saying that you should have proof of our integrity. You should have proof of our integrity. Your, cons your conscience should acquit us of unworthy motives. Because he's got folks that are coming in there teaching false teaching and basically condemning Paul in the way he is going about teaching the word of God. Oh, Paul is teaching that you don't need to be circumcised? Oh, no. Let me, let me tell you what, what you really have to do to be a good person in the eyes of God. They're maligning him. And Paul is saying, you ought to know. You ought to know. There's nothing that we are telling you that is not of God. Verse 12. It says, we are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. Paul is not trying to brag about everything that he is or everything that he does at all. But those individuals that are maligning him are mo more focused on the outward appearance of a person, how they dress, how they look, the type of speech that they have, the flowery voices. That's not what Paul is saying for us to do. Are we, are we judging people by their outward appearance? It can be very easy to do. Years and years and years ago, uh, 20 plus years ago, I had a friend of mine that I invited to come to the church that I was attending at the time. And he came. And about three weeks later, I noticed I hadn't seen him at church. So I asked him one day, I said, hey, why aren't you and your family coming to church? And he said, uh, oh, I don't know. I said, come on, man, tell me. Did you not like the, the preaching? Or He said, uh, Bob, they, uh, they said I wasn't dressed right. Man, that killed me. So from that day on, at that church, the entire time, from that moment until the time I left that church, I wore a pair of overalls, I had the crotch ripped out, and I wore a pair of yellow boxer shorts underneath. And I said, no one's going to make fun of my friend for the way that they're dressed. Because it's not about the outward appearance, guys. It's about what's in the heart. Verse 13. If we are out of our mind, it is for the sake of God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. Basically, Paul's saying, you know what? I am sold out for Jesus. I am a fanatic. I don't care what other people say about me when it comes to my reaction to the love I have for Jesus Christ. Are we willing to do that? Are we willing to be considered crazy for Jesus? Oh, Bob, the world today, it's, it's different. It's got to be politically correct. We got we to gotta take into consideration other people's feelings. We can't say certain things in schools anymore. I don't want to pray at work with people because someone might say something to HR. Think Paul would have prayed with someone at work? Absolutely. Are we fanatical for and about Jesus Christ? Church, if we're not, who else is going to be? It's not going to be the world. They are not going to be fanatical for Jesus. I'll tell you that right now. But then he says, if we, are in, if we are in our right mind, it is for you. Some translations, it says we are sober. If we are sober, it is for you. And basically what he is saying is, 
We're not going to mince words when it comes to delivering this message. It's going to be accurate, and it's going to be pointed, and it's going to cause you, if the Holy Spirit is working within you, it's going to cause you to be different than you are today. Is that what we're hoping for on Sunday morning, church? That we will leave this place changed, transformed, different, better than we are now? When we walked in, are we trying to be more like him? Or are we just checking off the box? Saying, eh, we made it to church. Look, God, look, see, I made it four Sundays in a row. That's not what it's about. Why? Because God knows the motives in our heart. Verse 14. For Christ's love compels us, or in some translations, constrains us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. Christ's love compels us. You know, there are certain things that I really like. Once upon a time, it used to be football. I don't watch it anymore. I'm boycotting. But I could talk about football for hours. And there are certain other things that I could talk about for hours that I really, really enjoy being a part of and doing. How do I do when it comes to sharing the love of Christ? You know, if someone comes up to me at work, I was thinking about this. If someone comes up to me at work and says, hey, hey Bob, can, can you tell me about Jesus? And you know, I'll spend hours. Because I love talking about my Savior. But what about those individuals who don't say anything to me? Am I still willing to step out of my comfort zone and maybe say just one phrase enough to cause them to maybe ask a question? Well, they didn't ask me. Well, let's step again. <laughs> Can I pray for you? Well, yes. Then let's pray. Not walk away and say, I'll be praying for you. How does the love of Christ compel you? Is it causing you to think differently about your coworkers? Is it causing you to think differently about your lost family members? Is it causing you to think different about the cashier that rang it up wrong and you're frustrated and there's 15 people in front of you and it takes 20 minutes? Ugh! Where's the love of Christ? At that moment. Is it our selfish ambition that compels us? Or is it the love of Christ? Because we are convinced, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. One died for all is speaking of Christ, Jesus Christ, right? And he died for all. One died for all. When you look at the, from the beginning of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, it talks about Adam. It talks about Eve. Adam always gets a bad rap for sinning, but it really was Eve. We all know that. <laughs> Those women, pesky women, no. Uh, but because of the fall of man, and God, God knew that was going to happen. He didn't cause it to happen, but he knew it was going to happen. He set up that plan for Jesus Christ to come to this earth, live in a human body, fully God, fully man, to go to the cross and die for all people's sin. Plain and simple. And it says, one died for all, and therefore all died. So if Christ died for all, we, as human beings, without a risen Savior, we're all dead. We're dead. We're going to be eternally separated from God if we die without accepting Jesus Christ as our Savior. Plain and simple. And you know, the interesting thing is, death always wins. It's a 100% rate, no matter how you look at it, death always wins from a physical body standpoint. Did you know that wars don't increase death? 
Famine doesn't increase death. Natural disasters don't increase death. Death is death. Everyone dies. Some might die sooner because of those things, but death is death. And without a risen Savior, our spiritual death will be for eternity. Thanks be to Christ for dying in our stead. Verse 15, And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. If that's not a salvation message all in itself, I don't know what is. But the question that I have for me and the question that I have for you that those who live should no longer live for themselves. What do we spend the majority of our time doing? Trying to please us. It's easy to do. Jesus Christ is no longer here on this earth. He's up at the right hand of the Father. The Holy Spirit is here with us now. We can't see the Holy Spirit. I, I look in the mirror in the morning, I don't see the Holy Spirit. I see me. And, and what's my job today? It's to please me. Make me feel good. You ever had that attitude? It happens. The Word is alive. Bobby just said you couldn't see the Holy Spirit, and I can't. But I can see these words, and I can allow the Holy Spirit to talk to me. How often are we allowing the Holy Spirit to talk to us through this word? Oh, Bob, you know, I, I, I read on Sunday mornings when you do. It's not just about the doing. Again, it's God knows our heart. Are, are we reading the word again so we can check a box off and say, yep, got it read. That's not, what, that's not what our intent needs to be. Verse 16. It says, So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. What in the world does that mean? Are we judging the world based on worldly standards? Shame on us. We need to be judging the world and viewing the world from a God perspective. Does God care for the soul of each and every person on this earth? It's a rhetorical question, but I'll answer it anyway. Yes, yes he does. Do we? Oh, Bob, that, that person, they, they, they got an aroma about them. I, I don't want to talk to them. They're different than I am. God doesn't want me to speak to them. No, 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 church. And then he says, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Remember who Paul was, right? He was Saul of Tarsus. He was under the teaching of Gamaliel. I think that's how you pronounce his name. He was part of the Sanhedrin. Do you think that he knew who Jesus Christ was? Oh, he's a heretic. He's that guy that thinks that he's performing miracles for the name of God. But he's speaking heresy against the teachings of Moses and the law of God. Paul knew who Jesus was before his transformation. Before Paul's transformation, that is. Saul was killing people for the name of God. He was killing Christians because he thought it was hearsay. Paul knew who this carpenter guy was. But guess what? Paul says, what? We do so no longer. Why? Because he's a risen Messiah. He ain't no carpenter anymore. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Verse 17. We're starting to get into the last few bites. We're coming to that dessert. I can't wait. Therefore, I love that word, therefore. 
Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Were you transformed when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Are you continuing to be transformed as you are a member of his family? We have to be. We are a new creation. Listen, we were all sinners before we accepted Jesus Christ. We were destined for hell. We could do nothing on our own to accept Jesus Christ or accept that ticket to heaven except for believing that Jesus Christ was the Savior of the world. That's it. Easy peasy. 15, 20, 30 years ago, when I was unsaved, I did things that I am not proud of. And I'm sure some of you can relate to that. But what does this say? It says, I am a new creation. I can't let the devil to hold me down because of things that occurred in my past that Jesus Christ died on the cross for. I am a new creation. I'm not going to let the devil tell me, Bob, oh, you can't, you can't teach the Word of God. Remember what you did? No, 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 no. Once I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior, that's all gone. As far as the East is from the West, don't let your past hinder your, your evangelistic opportunities now. Matter of fact, use them to your advantage because you, because of what you had lived through in the past, have an opportunity to share with other people that are going through those same things right now. Do you believe that? Matter of fact, on the, uh, the little app thing that we use and we put prayer requests on, when Oneida shared that note about the passing of her father, someone, Ida, posted on there, hey, I lost my parents at a very young age. Let's get together and we can talk. She's got an experience from her life I don't have that she can relate with Oneida about. God uses everyone. Oh, God doesn't want to use me. Yes, he will. If you allow him to, God will allow your life to be a story for someone else. Verse 18. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation reconciled reconciled man that's a three syllable word when I think of the word reconciled I didn't look up Webster this is Bob's di dictionary it means that the balance is clear it's gone I don't know anything anymore zero there's no debt any longer that I have Christ wiped that sin away when I accepted him and confessed my sins and repented. So all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So through Christ, again, dying on the cross for our place. That is that reconciliation. The death of Jesus reconciled us to God. God the Father. Verse 19. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sin against them. So, everything that was over here in the sin column, God said, Jesus, take care of that, would you? Gone. Now, then what does it say? What does it say here? It says, verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Verse 20, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So God didn't just say, hey, 
I'm going to take away all of these sins. What did he do then? He filled it. That's what this says in this next verse. 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become, what? The righteousness of God. So he didn't just take away the sin out of our column. He filled it with righteousness. Oh, Bob, you mean we're supposed to be righteous? Yes. Yes, we are. Is there anything wrong with being righteous? Not if we look at it from the standpoint of a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about righteous indignation. Oh, you're a sinner. You're going to hell. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. And I am so happy that you did this, that you gave me this ministry of reconciliation. I am going to be what? An ambassador. Oh, wait, wait. Didn't it say that already? Let's go back and let's read that verse again. Verse 20. We are therefore, therefore what? Because we have been given the ministry, the message of reconciliation. We are going to be Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Does God want to save everybody? Yes. He wants everyone to be saved. He knows it's not going to happen, but he wants everyone to be saved. Well, God, you better get busy. He is. He's working in your heart. He's working in your heart. He's working in your heart. So that we will have a desire to be an ambassador for him. During the time of the, the Romans being in the that whole section, I don't know what you call it, I'm not very good at geography. They were in charge, the Romans. They were in charge. And there were a couple of different types of provinces that occurred under Roman rule. You had the senatorial provinces, which basically they would walk into a country or to a city and say, hey, we're, we're here, or we're going to be in charge from now on, and they would lay down their arms and they would allow the Romans to come in and take over the province. That was a senatorial province. Then you had what was called the imperial province, which is where the people said, mm, no, that ain't going to happen, and were very rebellious, fought tooth and nail. And in those instances, Rome would send an ambassador. Guess what, church? Do you think the world that we are a part of is rebellious, fighting tooth and nail against the work of the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ? Absolutely. What are you going to do about it? Oh, Jesus, they don't need you. They don't, they don't really want you. Do I have to go? Does the love of Christ compel you to be an ambassador? And when I run across people that want to hear about Jesus, I'll bend over backwards to tell them. I'll break out my Bible and we'll share verses but what about the folks that don't? Those are the ones that are going to die. Remember that 100% death rate. You, you can't win. Everyone's going to die. But are we willing to plant the seed? Remember, it's not us. It's God working through us. It's not about us. But do we love Jesus Christ enough and that love that we have for him to drive us, to compel us to share the gospel message, to share the message of reconciliation, this ministry of reconciliation. Think, oh, Bob, I don't, I don't know the Bible. You don't have to to tell people that Jesus loves them. You don't have to to tell them your story, your testimony about how you came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to do those things. Well, Bob, I don't have the gift of evangelism. Okay, so it's a little tougher for you. It does not preclude you. If you have the love of Christ compelling you, it's what we have to do, church. 
Are you willing to be that ambassador? In verse 21 it says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. Some think that Jesus not didn't just represent all of the sin and all of our sin was piled on him, but that he actually sinned because of that and he was tainted. That is completely wrong. It is about Jesus Christ being that sacrifice for us. Plain and simple. For all sins from the beginning of time until the end of time. There is no limit to the number of sins that Jesus died for. Zero. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's pretty cool when you think about it. I mean, th these 10 verses, I think it's 10, 21 minus 11, 10. 10 verses. Here's a gospel message right here. The end of the book of Matthew, it says, Go therefore, making disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey my commands. Well, what are we supposed to teach? Let's start with this. How about that? You know, Jesus died for you. And he loves you. And he wants you to be one of his kids. Well, who's this Jesus fellow? Oh, well, let me tell you. And it opens the door right there. But you know what I have found over the course of time? that I've been um, a believer in Jesus Christ. There's a lot of folks that um, get pretty upset when you start talking about Jesus. And what I find, the majority of the time, is it was someone who used to go to church. They got hurt. Someone said something to them. You're not dressed well enough to come here, boy. It's not because they don't believe who Jesus is. They don't want to associate with us. Church, we have got to do a, a better job of treating the world like Jesus would. Not looking at the outward appearance of a man, but looking at the heart. And, I mean, just since we've been working on this building and trying to get it ready. Man, this is going to be some fun stuff, boys and girls, when we get over there. And if you haven't been, I, I would encourage you, I would plead with you to be praying now for our hearts to be molded and softened to be like Jesus. We've got a huge community of folks over there that may or may not know who Jesus is. They may or may not have been hurt in other churches. But I read this book. It was, a, uh, it was a business book, but it was about a Christian business. And it was about this guy who was an international business, if you will. And he got to uh, minister to uh, the nation of Israel, trying to bring in business so that they could support themselves financially. And this was a Christian man. And while he was doing this, and, and this huge conference was going on, pairing businesses together from inside of Israel to outside of Israel, trying to get import and export set up, this rabbi came to him, and he said these words. He said, because you have taken care of our physical needs, one day you will get to take care of our spiritual needs. Here we go, church. We're going to run into a lot of physical needs. If we fall down in that respect, we won't necessarily always have that opportunity to take care of the spiritual needs. Think about that for a minute. It opens the door. It helps build relationships. You think, oh, they just keep coming. They just keep wanting stuff. We're going to have a lot of that. We're going to have to deal with it. When we run out of stuff, well, then we quit giving it. 
If we got it, give it. It's kind of like one of those kids' songs I used to sing in churches. It said, uh, God loves a cheerful giver. And I was a part of this denomination. I'm not going to say which one, but we always add it on the end. Give them all you got. Church, are we, are we sold out for Jesus? Some days I question my own motives. I get to that stinking thinking where it's all focused on me. I got to snap out of that, church. I need, I need your prayers. I don't want to be there. But everything around us in this world is attacking us from all sides. If we do not rely on the Holy Spirit as our protector, that seal of redemption that we have inside of us, and we're relying on our own strength, we will fail every time. But we don't have to. Why? Because we are the righteousness of God. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, wow, I thank you for that dessert today. That righteousness, Father. Lord, I pray that today will be a turning point in our life in that, in that journey of being a new creation. That we won't stop desiring to tell people about who your son, Jesus Christ, is. Lord, we love him. And Lord, we want that love that we have for him to compel us to tell the world about this ministry of reconciliation, Father. Only through your son, Jesus Christ, do we have an opportunity to be children of the Most High God. And Lord, put in us the desire to share this message to everyone that we come into contact with. In Jesus' name, amen. And uh, we'll praise the Lord for that awesome dessert that he gives to us today. I'm a running out of darkness and out of shame.
for being the only way to the Father. Lord, thank you for revealing it to each one who is saved here today and now help us to go out and to help you reveal it to others. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, can be dismissed. Mm -hmm.